Pack your bags, bitch. We're going to hell. Excuse me? Vanessa said, staring at me with her left eyebrow raised slightly higher than her right. Her mouth was slightly agape. From a nonverbal standpoint, it was telling me her raised eyebrow and open mouth wasn't out of shock, as much as confusion and or offense for me calling her a bitch out of context. To be fair, I never really talked to my sister like that, besides the occasional sibling fight when we were children. Also, I just told her I was in town minutes ago before walking through her open front door. The look on her face was priceless. What can I say? I like to keep my friends, and especially family, on their toes. I raised one of the corners of my mouth involuntarily when I'm trying to stifle a smile, just as I had been doing since I was a kid. I could feel the burning in my cheeks. Some of that was from the negative zero asshole degrees outside. But mostly, it was just what happened to me when I get a little bit embarrassed. Sorry, sis. You know I get over dramatic. I'm sorry I called you that. Vanessa, who I usually called Ness, or sis, crossed her arms. This dislodged a piece of black hair that was tucked behind her ear. She shook her head to the side to move it out of the way. Just like when she was a kid, baby sis, grown up, but looking just like the kid's sister she always was to me. I could give a fuck less about the bitch part, Pete. It's the hell part. Is this another one of your stupid goofs just to see how I'd react? She looked at me as I looked at her. It's been longer than I'd like since we saw each other. I talk and text with her and her husband often, as she does with me and my wife. I make sure to reach out to her young son, my nephew, and see them at least once a year. Not enough, but living across the country makes travel difficult. And seriously, you just tell me you're in town like an hour ago and show up here unannounced? What the- I put both hands up, palms facing towards her. I slightly move my head to the right, pursing my lips, as if I'm making the shush motion. After I lower my arms, I try to lock eyes with her. Black just like mine, and give her my best, reassuring smile. <laughs> Works every time. She huffs and shoots me back and I hate you, but it's nice to see you look. After we hugged and moved into the dining room, I lay out what exactly is going on. First off, you look great. That's my opener as we sat down. Ness narrows her eyes, putting a coffee mug in front of me. She knows I'm trying to soften the mood. No, no, I mean it, I plead. She ignores that line and turns towards whatever name brand machine that makes coffee these days. I eye the store brand coffee she's putting into it and I can't help myself. Um, I'm... Uh, Sorry, sis, but do you have any almond milk? Or if not, maybe some kind of organic creamer? Damn it, Peter. You fucking get a fluke job as a writer on that stupid series in LA and now you're too good to have black coffee? I hate being called Peter. She knows that. But I don't blame her. Yes, I worked my ass off to write for Hollywood. Started by cleaning little shits out of the toilets of the Capitol Records building learning how to write liner notes from a sympathetic assistant. From there, I self-published some compelling investigations that caught the eye of some prick at Sundance. Once I got my first advanced, I used that to do what I really wanted, horror. Now, almost 20 years later, I've become a very successful go-to guy to write or help write the next horror blockbuster. Peter was fine as a kid, until everybody learned that it was another slang for penis. <laughs> it's been Pete from then on. Vanessa rolls her eyes, no doubt still processing the last 30 minutes or so. Shaking her head, she fills her cup, and then mine. So, Mr. Scary Guy, this is the part where you tell me that yes, 
Indeed, this is just my adolescent idea of a prank. I just really wanted to see you and the family and thought making a Hollywood entrance would be funny for me. I tipped the mug to my lips. I kept my eyes on hers. We always did this, that kind of don't break eye contact or you're the loser slash less dominant one kind of game. The coffee burnt the shit out of my lower lip and tongue. I didn't let her see that though. I'm sure she would have loved that. After we both finished our respective staring contest, both cups were placed back down. I decided to be the bigger man. I am the oldest, so I can let her have one win from time to time. I looked down into my mug. Without even seeing her, I could feel the satisfaction on her smug face. Not looking up still, I let her know what was going on. No, sis, this has nothing to do with Hollywood. Believe me, I wish I was back there finishing up the last rewrite to the end of that Blood House trilogy. It's supposed to be the highest grossing third movie in the trilogy F. I happened to look at her while attempting to finish that sentence. I could see she was not impressed. I don't think she's ever seen a movie I've written on. I stretched out my jaw, something I've done as a child whenever I was getting overly stressed. I'm sure it looks off-putting to anyone in public, like I'm trying to unhinge like a python. But she knows what it means, and by looking at her, she finally calms down, seemingly ready to listen. Ah, <sighs> okay. We are going to save Becky. Now she knew this was not a jokey visit. She froze when Becky left my vocal cords. Becky Malone? She said, I nodded. The one and only, I responded. Vanessa and I are twins, fraternal. Our parents were around, but not around. Hard to explain it exactly. I wish I could say they did their best, but I don't want to lie or rewrite history. We always had food and clothes and shelter. What else could you ask for, right? Maybe some support. Maybe some affection. Maybe some advice for when we were both getting the shit kicked out of us on our way home from school. I don't know. Becky came out of the woodworks kind of literally when the normal shithead bullies were taking out their weekly aggressions on us. On that fateful day, I was doing my best to shield my kid sister by minutes from the O'Doyle boys. I remember trying my best to hold on to her Lisa Frank Trapper Keeper with all my might. It was no match for those mongoloids. Then our angel from the woods appeared. Becky, who lived about a block over, made herself known. There was a small patch of trees separating our two subdivisions. I can still see her walking sideways towards us. I was on the ground, you see, getting kicked and punched while holding her dolphin and flower dotted folder tightly to my chest like a football. She calmly walked over to us. She said one word and both O'Doyle boys turned towards her. Too late. She swiftly slapped one across the mouth, blood spraying to the grass. I think a tooth was knocked out. She then looked at the other and gave him a boot for his trouble. They both ran off like scolded dogs, never to hurt us again. Our undying loyalty started. Becky left after high school and bounced around the country. We kept in touch sparingly, and when social media became a thing, I happened to find her. I ran my index finger around the rim of my now half-empty coffee mug. I haven't kept in touch like I'd like to, just like you and your boy, I said sheepishly. She reached out to me about a week ago and said that she was coming back to Michigan. We all grew up in the Great Lakes State, Lower Michigan near Lake Huron. Very remote. She said she was going to hell. Hell, Michigan, that is. We used to joke about it, but none of us ever made the trip to the weirdly named town. 
It seemed like a kind of novelty, but it really was called hell. Vanessa shook her head. Okay, so what's going on then? She randomly reached out to tell you she was going to be in hell, and then you came all the way here, almost 2,800 miles away from your Hollywood Hills home, for no other reason? She squinted at me, still trying to understand what the whole point of this is. I know, sounds silly, but her last voicemail really got to me. It was about two days ago. I pulled my phone out, placing it on the table. I pulled up the voicemail, which I saved, and tapped the play button. Hey, Peter. Again, I hate that name. She knew that. But that's what she called me, just like my sister. So I'm back here. I probably shouldn't. I passed the bridge. Something, something is following me. I don't know what. I don't know. I need help. I need you guys to help me. And that's all of it. I looked at my sister as the voicemail stopped. She had her left hand over her mouth, looking down at my phone, which was now black. She raised her eyes to mine, taking her hand away from her mouth. So what the fuck are we supposed to do, Peter? Go drive two plus hours to hell and just hope we find her? She obviously needs help, Ness. You heard how panicked she was. Maybe she got lost. Or took too many drugs or shit. I don't know. Vanessa took both of our mugs and threw them in the sink. This is ridiculous. You can stay here for however long you need, but I'm not dropping everything to see if Becky needs help. She wasn't being mean, just logical, like she always was. Ness, I said. She stopped those fat Irish gorillas from fucking with us. She was there for us the rest of our childhood. She needs us. Maybe she was replaying that scene in her head. Maybe she was remembering how great of a friend she was to us. It was hard to tell. I could only see her back, both arms placed on the sink. Her head was hanging low, presumably staring down into the sink and garbage disposal, like there were answers to be found down there. After an incredibly uncomfortable silence, I spoke. We have to try. Something just feels bad. We should. Vanessa turned around so quick. It was like an edit in a movie. You find out where she is and I'll consider it. With that, she trounced upstairs, leaving me sitting at her dining room table. I texted, called, emailed, and reached out to all of her social media that I could find without success. The last thing I remember was looking at my watch. The black fossil watch I'd been given as a graduation gift displayed 0535 hours. Then it was daylight. I woke up to a sound that like an elephant and its cub, baby. I don't know what they call baby elephants, stampeding through my head. Uncle Pete! It was my nephew and his dad. Holy shit, bud. It's great to see you. My brother-in-law, Mark. Decent guy. Vanessa met him as soon as we left high school. I had no idea you were coming into town, brother. Me and the little guy have to head out to get some Chinese. Chinese sounds good, right, little man? My nephew smiled several teeth missing. One eye barely open, I agreed and raised my hand towards my sister's child. Yeah, a high five, dude. He smacked it with more force than I had anticipated. Nice, Mark said. He winked at me, gave his son his backpack, and they were out the door. Shaking the early morning off, I looked for my phone. Shit, where did I, oh, there it is, on the ground, right by the couch, I somehow passed out on. Phone calls, zero. Social media, zero. Email, one. From Becky Malone 83 at gmail.com, two. Pete, not Peter, at gmail.com. My personal account. There's a white motel. I can't type much. I don't have time. 
Go over the bridge. That's the last thing I remember. Please hurry, both of you. My eyes widened as I fell off the couch. Not a hard fall or anything, but it was still jarring. I scrambled to get back to my feet, again searching for where the phone went. Somehow, it fell between my legs. As I was digging for it in my still half-awake state, I could feel the looming shadow of my twin. I'm packed. We're taking my car or yours. Vanessa had received the same email as I had. Not thinking too much about it, since they haven't been in contact since high school, I happily got my shit together as quickly as I could. We decided to keep my piece of shit rental car at her place and take her Dodge Ram. It'll do the job and double as a place to sleep if needed. The first hour was plagued with dead silence, same power play we we're both used to. Who will talk first? Whoever does is the weaker one. Again, I'm getting too old for this, so I break the awkward silence. So, do you remember the time when Becky said, oh shit, a text from Becky? Becky. Are you almost here? I looked at Ness. I showed her my phone, her eyes widened slightly. Then she nodded at my phone. Me. Yeah, what the hell, Beck? What is going on? Where are you? Becky. It's almost here. I tried hiding. Me. Becky, where are you? No response. What in the actual hell, sis? I said, staring at my phone. She shook her head in agreement, maintaining eye contact on the road. It finally felt like we were both on the same page. She needed help. She needed to be saved. This wasn't like her. This wasn't the Joan of Arc character that came out of the trees to change our lives forever. Becky was never in trouble. She created trouble. She was feared. She was fierce. She was our friend. One hour later, there it is. I shot up, arms that were just in cross position, now uncrossed. I rubbed my eyes with my left hand and put my right hand over my chest, instinctively, I suppose. We all have weird reactions when being snapped out of a quick sleep. Vanessa let out a small giggle, two hands on the wheel, knowing I was somewhat out of my sleep state. She nodded. I looked to where she was looking. Big giant green freeway sign. I almost missed it. Hell Township. Next exit. We're here, darling. Welcome to hell. I said, trying not to sound like I had just cleaned drool that was leaking from my lower lip. I always wanted to say that in this context. Vanessa, my blood, my twin, barely cracked one quarter of a smile. She's just as creative as I, but never embraced it after we got older. I wish I knew why. She simply put her turn signal on and safely merged on the ramp towards hell. Any other notifications? She said, referring to Becky. I checked my phone. Nope, not a one. I tried to hide the disappointment in my voice. I'm sure she picked up on that. I wanted to actually save Becky, and I know that my sister does too, but we don't want to be out here on a wild goose hunt either. Let me look over that last email or text. Maybe I missed something. I looked at her and shrug while we are both stopped by the first octangular sign since we entered the freeway nearly two hours ago. Vanessa nods, puts her hands in her lap, and right foot placed on the brake, waiting for one car coming east to clear the exit. Wait. She says. I looked up, barely dipping into my emails. White Motel? Isn't that what she said in the text to you? I looked at her, following her line of sight. Sure as fucking shit. Ness... Go there. 
As we slowly made the left turn into the town of hell, we both remarked how it reminded us of an old western setting. But this is modern times, and people actually still live here. This isn't a ghost town or a tourist town. Well, it is, but this part had no bells and whistles like we expected. We both entered the Hell Motel, very original. Every single thing in this town has hell in front of it. The unmistakable stench of bleach and cigarettes assaulted my senses. I side-eyed Vanessa. She seemed to experience the same olfactory sensation. I resisted putting my navy blue Detroit Tigers sweatshirt over my face. I took a couple of steps towards the counter. The lady manning the desk was an absolute behemoth of a person. She strained to raise her eyelids up. Her dark pupils followed hesitantly towards mine. Ugh, can I help you? Yes, yes, sorry, I stuttered. For a professional writer, I'm not always the best speaker. I shot a quick glance at my sister, the more succinct of us. She had nothing. Guess it's on me. Um, yes, hello, miss. Uh, we're here to meet our friend. She wanted us to meet her here at the Hell Hotel. Her name is Becky. Can't remember her last name. Honestly, I couldn't. Would you be able to help us? Big Bertha here shifted her weight from her right forearm to her left. I thought the bar stool she was sitting on would collapse. I don't mean to be mean, but she was not a dainty lady. Becky, huh? She said. With that, she flipped through her blog book. Not a computer. Oh yeah, she checked in last week. She left yesterday. Looks like the party is already over. Sorry you missed your fun. She barred at a mouthful of morbidly jagged yellow teeth. Fighting the urge to vomit, I bared down on the counter. Ah, no, it's nothing like that. She's just a high school friend. It was kind of a, a meetup. It's all I could think of. I looked at my sister for backup, but she was too involved with the weirdness of this by the hour motel. Nah, sure, hon. Bertha said, which now I was solidly assuming was her name. Look, these girls come and go. Contact them from whatever back page site you guys use. Either rent a room or leave. I can't be of any help to you. Ness and I are now back outside of the motel. How are we supposed to find her? She said, looking around at this tombstone-like town. I stood in one spot for a good five minutes before I came up with nothing. I don't know, sis. Shit, I just don't know. I let the wind brush over my face and hair, hair that thankfully was still there, receding, but still there. How are we going to find her? Just as I had that thought, the wind picked up. The smell. I've been near the ocean for a long time, but not long enough to forget the difference in ocean air and river air. Sounds silly, but I know there's a river nearby, which means there probably will be a bridge somewhere close. Ness, pull out your phone and find that bridge. Why didn't we just start there? I said, shaking my head in disgust. My sibling looked at me with concern. I expected some sharp retort, some admonishing for my lack of thought, but she didn't. I forgot too, bro. Hey, at least we're here. We're going to save Becky. I'll comb Google Maps. I'll find it. We both smiled at each other. I needed her help, and I needed her right now. I'll probably never tell her how much she means to me. Back in the truck. So, I googled all the bridges here in hell. She stated. I even got on the Hell Unincorporated website to see if any engineering information on bridges in the area exist. I didn't find crap. So, I continued pouring over the 400 acres that Hell laid claim to, and I found this. 
She thrust her phone into my face, almost hitting it. I had to take a little stutter step back once I focused on it. I saw it. A tiny bridge that was built over a tiny creek. Looks like a park of some sort. A couple of the town's handymen or women probably did it out of the goodness of their hearts. This is not the Los Angeles way, I can tell you that. Drop that pin, I said. We are going to get her. It's gotten dark, real dark. I checked my phone again, nothing. We were only about 200 feet away, so that was good. I forgot how small this area was. We left the safety of her truck and started walking. I couldn't tell from the hell motel that this park was directly in its backyard. Nightfall had transformed this wooded area with a few businesses inside of it into a stock horror story set. Luckily, we both carried flashlights. Seemed like a total chance, but as we talked, we both remembered always carrying a flashlight when we walk into the woods. Some things never change. Hey. Ness said, stopping in the middle of this narrow bridge. It was maybe five feet wide, just enough for two people to walk side by side. I stopped by her side, waiting. I don't normally believe in the clairvoyant stuff, but something feels bad, like... Well, just bad. That didn't make me feel good. I shrugged and pointed my flashlight forward. Let's keep moving ahead. What happened for the next 30 minutes, I'll never be able to explain. It felt like we walked in circles, confusion. At one point, I completely lost track of my sister. Thankfully, I caught her light a few dozen feet in front of me. Weird. I called out to her to stop, which she did. When I caught up with her, I noticed she was staring to her right. She was looking at a makeshift shack of some kind. What the hell? It looked like an abandoned hunting shack. It was maybe 10 feet by 10 feet. Sh should we go in? She said. We, we have to, we have to. It was getting grim. Just as we started to move towards it, we heard something moving inside. It was terrifying, but hopeful at the same time. Becky has to be in there. She might be hurt. She might be confused. She might be in more trouble than we thought. We both cautiously made our way towards the door of this monstrosity. The structure looked like it was raised with aluminum siding. I looked at my sister, silently nodding to her that I would be opening the door. I reached for the odd-looking wooden handle and pushed it open. The inside looked even darker than the outside where we are currently standing. Hello? Becky? Is, is anyone here? <laughs> Sobbing. I now took one step inside, holding Nessa's hand without even realizing it. In the northwest corner, I saw her. Flashlight off, eyes now somewhat adjusted to the darkness, I saw her. A wooden chair with a person occupying it, long, dark hair, a faint, grayish band that was wrapped around it, presumably restricting her body to the chair. Her head, once bowed, now raised. The back of her head was facing our direction. Please stay quiet, and please, no, I'm sorry. I didn't break my gaze, but I knew that my sister had the same terrifying expression on her face as I did. In a hushed tone, I spoke. Hey, Beck, is that you? Are you okay? We are here for you, me and Ness. The sobbing continued. She tried to stifle it so much, but I could tell she was at something of a breaking point. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to- Shh. Another voice emanated from the corner of this shack. Ness and I both snapped towards the sound of that voice. We both saw it at the same time. A hooded figure, squatting. In the corner. Even in the darkness, this form was visible. 
At least the outline was. It rose from his squatty position and stood. In my estimation, it was well over six feet tall. Becky couldn't stop crying, and it's getting worse. I'm sorry, I didn't mean it. Quiet, bitch. The thing said, now talking in the opposite of a whisper, almost blew the structure apart with those words. I felt that Becky was tense. She arched her shoulders and tucked her head into her chest in response to an incoming abuse. Even in pitch black, I could see that. My sister and I stood frozen. We both dared not to move. The thing took one step forward, still a mystery. I could only see a massive humanoid figure. To this day, I'm telling myself it was a person, but no person could have been so deviant. As if hearing my thoughts, it spoke. This shouldn't have concerned you, both. I'm not sorry you're here, though. I could feel the smile spread across its horrific face. Fuck you, you fucking prick. My sister Ness shouted, not out of character for her, but definitely not great timing at this point. I recoiled. From the yelling and the intensity, I shamefully grabbed her hand or whatever I could grab and attempted her to back out of here. Stop! It spoke. And for some reason, we did. Becky started rocking back and forth in that chair. I could hear something from her, but couldn't make it out. Finally, crying emerged from her again. The entity swooped by her side. A man couldn't have moved that quick. But I just couldn't believe what I was seeing at the time. It put a hand, or what I'd assume was a hand, on her head. It patted sympathetically. Shh. Again from its maw, I could tell Becky tried so hard not to cry. She was so much stronger than this. I, d I did not mean for this to happen. I should have asked. She was caught off by the thing. His extremity that was resting on top of her head slid down to her throat. Me and Ness instinctively tried to move forward, but were frozen. It's funny, actually, the thing said, now sounding more human. All I wanted to do was to carry out what I've done for generations. But I had a feeling with this one. As it trailed off, he stroked Becky's hair. I was sickened. I asked her. I asked her. I said, who else knows you're here? Oh, sure, she tried to lie, but for some reason, for some reason, I knew. She had her phone. I looked. She texted you. She tried. Maybe some consolidation, but also no loose ends. You understand? I was once again holding Ness's hand. This champion that we haven't heard from in forever thought of us when she was in most danger than anyone could have faced. My face was warm. Tears, tears streamed down my face. I assumed Vanessa was also crying, but I dared not take my eyes off the monster. I still couldn't make out its face, but I felt it. Like it, it was smiling. Finally, I spoke. <laughs> Please, please let her go. We will never come back here. We will never speak of this. Before I completed the letter S, he shot Becky in the side of the head. The muzzle flash lit up the room. I saw her head move slightly to the left and then drop towards her chest, motionless. In that split second, I wish I could remember what he looked like. My sister panicked. She ran through the door. In my head, I tried to stop her, but I... I know... But I know I didn't. I was stuck in place. The last thing I remember before I lost consciousness was the smell. 
of gunpowder and a pinch in my neck. Two weeks later, at my sister's funeral, I couldn't tell the police much, regrettably. Why did I survive? It was me that Becky asked for help from. I left my posh LA life to come back and drag her to her death. Becky was cremated on the other side of the state where her family was originally from. The failure of not helping her when she helped us will haunt me until the day I mercifully pass on. I went back to hell years later. The bridge had been removed. The shack, you guessed it, has been removed. I don't know if that's because of the double murder, but it feels like these two women's lives have been removed. There are only four places in the world, in the world, that have been named hell. Of all the places to die, of all the places to die, such a horrible death. Why? Hell.